So uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order at, at nine minutes. At nine minutes after, we have the select board. We have uh, Randy Drury. We have Dorinda, the treasurer. We have Dexter LeFaver. We have Vic Dwyer. Uh, we have the budget committee. We have Orca Media. And we have Dave Delacour, who's the Times Argus reporter. So with that, uh, do we have any amendments to the agenda, Sarah? Yes, we do. We have uh, what Vic said earlier today regarding uh, the, the truck purchase. You just need to ratify, um, you just need to ratify something with the truck purchase, the accessories that you're going to buy, because you originally you originally approved the additions for the one truck, but then you voted on another trucks, but you didn't approve the accessories. Right. So let's, let's do that. If everybody agrees, let's do that under the highway report. Okay, but Sarah speaking. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> You're back, Sarah? I'm back. That was Mary. She is having a hard time signing in. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, with that, uh, the first item on our agenda is reviewing progress in the 22-23 municipal budget, considering COLA raises and other issues. Budget committee to attend action unlikely. And thank you, Dorinda, for all your, uh, all your hard work in terms of giving us that updated budget worksheet, as well as the uh, COLA worksheet. What I asked, what I asked Dorinda to do is do a raise worksheet based on based on three percent so we know what the total what the total money and the cost is at three percent and if it's a different number than that which it very well might be then we can just do it by percentage to get the to get the budget number but i guess i guess for a, and we can we can at some point during this, spend some time quickly going down through the entire budget again. But the big missing item, the big gorilla in the room, if you will, is what we're going to budget for raises uh, next July first, and then that trickles down to all the all the subcategories that Dorinda has highlighted. Uh, before we start talking about that, I would remind everybody that without those cola increases. We're already at a 6.37% budget increase. Uh, with that, I would I would open it up, uh, open it up for discussion. Is it 6.37 without any raises? Yes. And that's well, that's an with the raises that we just implemented, but no further raises. And that's and that's including the special articles that you're looking at, Peter. No, I don't think so. No, 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 no it never does it. And Peter, yeah, in yet? Peter, I think I have eight point two eight percent. So I don't know what report you're looking at. Well, that if you oh, look down, you know what I I did look at the thing which included the. Uh, the special articles. I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong number. Yeah, you got to go above that. Yes, it is. It is eight point two eight percent. Thank you, Dorinda. Peter, did every single person that works for us either get hired with a bonus or a higher starting rate, or alternatively, those who have been working for us get a raise with the last work that we did a couple of months ago and implemented immediately? Well, we've just barely implemented it. It was a lot sooner than a couple of months ago, but I believe the answer is yes. Except exception being the select board. We left ourselves alone. Well, we don't do it for the money. So um, is there any idea of what the percentage was for, for the the group, you know, the ones who got the kind of across the board went to a minimum of this, a minimum of that. 
it was all over the place, Mary, but it's in the it's in the existing budget numbers. You can see what that number is. I mean, the, yeah, I... the question is, the question is, and the hard part, and I spent some time uh, this afternoon, not a lot of time, but a little time looking at the uh, consumer price index, trying to figure out what an appropriate cost of living increase is. And as you know, they're saying the rate of inflation is somewhere between five and a half and six and a half percent. Uh, the consumer price index, of course, is looking is looking back, not forward. Uh, and it's depending on which one of their indexes you pick. It's all it's basically all over the place. But I couldn't I couldn't really determine anything which was meaningful. Yes, Mark, um, you're muted. Had, I'm sorry. No, we not. Now? Okay, so the, the federal rate is. Um, is published by the Social Security Administration for raises, increases next year for Social Security recipients was 5.9% the CPI. Right, right. So, I mean, it's a pretty steep increase, to say the least. And, you know, the challenge that we have is being on a, we're on a half year, half in this year, half in next year. So, you know, it's kind of tough to predict what inflation is going to do over the next six months. Oh, no, I... I agree. I agree 100%. And, and of course, the other, the other issue is uh, we just implemented all these raises, mid-year mid raises. So, so yeah. I, I'm just, I, I, you know, I've been struggling with this, trying to think about what I think is fair. Having The one thing I want to be sure of is if our, if our premise is by implementing the interim raises, which we implemented, that we now, right now, at this point in time, are paying our employees what we consider to be fair compensation. And hopefully that's the case with all, of, all the work we did going into that. Then the question is, if we're gonna implement another raise in basically seven months, uh, what's an appropriate raise to keep us in the same position? Or what's an appropriate budget amount to keep us in this in position? Yes, Mark. So just another comment with the, um, I'll call it the market adjustments that were done just recently. Um, looking at the, uh, the LCT compensation and benefits report for the, for the various uh, roles in our town government, we compare now very favorably with other towns that have, let's say, similar amount of full-time employees, similar uh, population, similar services. I think Dorinda gave that, gave that, us a copy of that report probably before we started talking about the budget increases, but we, we look pretty favorable right now compared to similar towns. I think that's true. What I, what I could, and I, you know, Dorinda, if you disagree, please speak up, but we are, we are, on the higher side of the middle of the pack, I would say. We are far from the highest. We are way far from the lowest, but we're, yes, I agree with what you said. So, you know, with that, what do we think the number is? And obviously it uh, has serious ramifications. Yes, Steve. Uh, Peter, I, I've also looked at this quite a bit, and and uh, but I think that that the COLA uh, effective next July should be uh, no more than three percent. Yep. The only my I don't have. Mary, would, you please, would you please just raise your hand or something when you want to speak, rather than just start speaking? That would be helpful. Yep. Thank you. Go ahead. The sheet I have only has zero, one, two, and three percent. Is there something else that that we that in case that we have a figures for more than that? I don't know what sheet you're looking at. The sheet I'm looking at, which Dorinda did this afternoon, it, which is the most recent, is three percent. Well, right. no, there was there was an email previous to that that had one, two. And then I screwed up on number 3%. So I sent a separate email for 
Oh, okay. So you I have what the numbers, you yeah. should have the numbers for one, two, and three percent. And then I figured you can make any combination of those two from there, or I can plug them in as we speak. Okay. Well, I, I apologize. When I saw that you changed the numbers, I didn't understand that you had the one and two on the other sheet. So I don't have it in mm -hmm. front of me. I have the 3% sheet in front of me. Mm -hmm. So yes, Mary. I have a question. Yes. Mark has a question. Mark has had his hand up as well. No, not, I know. Go ahead, Mark. So just a just a quick question, because I don't have the, I didn't pick up the new 3% sheet. So the new 3% Dorenda gives us what as a, um, as a budget increase as, a, as compared to 9.32? Uh, the 3% would be 9.32. That's oh, the one. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. Um, yep. And so the only other question I have, and there's probably not an easy answer to this is, I'm just wondering if we went with the 9.32, how does that translate to a, an impact to the tax rate based on grand list, et cetera? You know, how do we get from here to there? We can't. We That's can't gonna be a stab in the dark. We don't know about the, we won't know about the grand list until the spring. But the hope would certainly be, my hope would be being the optimist with what we've seen the sales to be that uh, we get a pretty good bump in the grand list, but it's very hard to. I, I laugh when I uh, when I see these articles in the paper where these municipal folks, particularly in Barry, are always projecting what the effect on the tax rate is. <laughs> they're really they're really shooting in the dark. Um, so you know, if you wanted to be really conservative, you'd say. A 9% increase met a 9% increase, but it doesn't. So just to clarify, so we we look to the grand list sales, the increase in the grand list to subsidize the increase. Correct. Okay, thanks. Bill, you want to comment? I think Liz had a question before me. Oh, I'm sorry, Liz. Thank you. Um, Dorinda, on the spreadsheet that you sent us it also has below the various scenarios on the fourth tab called sheet one the current policy for health insurance and then the health insurance with full spousal coverage because i know we've talked about that that 9.32 does not include that extra five thousand, does it that's so that correct. would be that'd be an even more of an increase if we were to include the spousal correct and i, and yes. I think that Am I, am I correct in saying that I think I read an article in the, maybe the Times Argus about the education um, rate possibly going quite a bit down next year because of a surplus of funds? Right. So that would, I mean, that would have an impact too, Mark, in terms of, and the grand list. I mean, it's a crapshoot right now to know what this, how this would ultimately affect people, except this might be a good year to do it if we know that the education rate is going down. Right, but that doesn't affect what we assess for the town. I mean, our our budget number is assessed, you know, the local portion is only assessed per what we have to raise to cover our increase. Mm, right, yep. Yeah. But it does affect, but it does affect the total tax bill potentially. If, they, if their rate came down overall, yes, but we have to give everything away that we get from them. So it's, you know, again, we're back to looking at it. The ultimate result is, yes, it might be a lower tax bill, but we also pay out to the schools. So whatever that number oh, comes I, in. I, believe me, I, I understand, but I, but I often think people, uh, people focus more on what they have to write the check out for than what portions go into the town, and what portions go into the school, but maybe I'm wrong about that. No, I, I agree with you there, but just, I mean, that the subsidy for the education tax coming surplus is essentially a one year deal. You know, this impact is, is, is carrying through. So let's not lose sight of that too. Yep. 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 All true. Um, my concern is that we had to make a pretty significant mid-year or <laughs> a quarter of the way into the year adjustment uh, to remain competitive uh, and to be able to hire people 
to be able to staff various positions in town government. I think we got in that case by basically keeping our increases low um, and looking at where we're headed. And again, it's really impossible from, from right now to look forward and say exactly what inflation is going to be. But I think, you know, we, we all can see what's happening at least right now. And I think while we're continuing in this pandemic, um, we're going to see that goods are going to remain scarce. Um, therefore, prices are going to be up. Services are going to be up. The cost of utilities are going to be up. And again, this all feeds into the inflation. And I think like all of you, I spent quite a while this afternoon looking at this. The other two pieces here is that a cost of living adjustment is just that. It is not a raise. So there's really two pieces to this. Uh, are we giving people a raise for uh, continued work and assumedly having more skills plus a cost of living adjustment or not? If, if in fact, inflation runs at five or six percent and we give three, people are effectively losing two to three percent. And if that's the case and other people raise wages, we're going to be right back where we were this year and we're going to start losing people because the labor market is going to continue to be, um, I think at least, uh, the way we're experiencing it right now. I think three is much too low and I hate to say it and hate to be in the position of having to raise taxes even more, but I think we just dug ourselves out of a hole and we need to stay dug out of that hole. So for me, the minimum is 5%. Scary. Scary, scary, scary. Yeah, I know. And you know, it's not like we've got a lot of places in the budget um, you know, or any budget in the past few years where we can offset that by cutting, um, you know, other, other things, you know, we're not going to be able to cut the highway department. We've got to have our roads. We've got to have them plowed. They have to be maintained. We have to, um, we have to pay for financial services so that we can continue to run the town. There just aren't a lot of places for us to tighten the belt uh, that I can see. One thing, the one, the one other area which we always talk about at the at the last minute is there is the potential, and this might be the year to do it. And this isn't when we make the decision, but we can think about it. Is using some of the fund balance to offset what would be the increase in the tax rate. You know, take a look at the grant list, see where it is. If we're at if we're at something, and we're we are going to be there pretty quick between 10 and 11 percent uh, mm -hmm. maybe we can knock it back under t I mean I, I just don't know that's the thing that makes this process process so hard it's going to be a, it's going to be a startling increase mm -hmm. no matter what it's a startling increase at three percent it's a little more startling at five percent and it's a little more startling when we deal with the health insurance problem so exactly uh, exactly you know, um, we, we, it is what it is. About, I, I, I do, just to finish up my thought, I, I do yeah. agree with what you said about COVID. And I also would hate to see us backslide after all the work we've done to get to where we are right now. But absolutely. I just, uh, and you know, who knows what kind of a town meeting we're going to have. That That's a... <laughs> You know, are we going to have a real in-person town meeting where we can sit down and explain this? Are we going to be, uh, are we going to have, a, you know, are we going to do the same thing we had to do last year? You know, we just, we just don't know. And we're not going to know, I guess, for a while. Right now, right now, I'm correct, Sarah, that we have to go back to an in-person meeting, right? As it stands now, the board has no authority to uh to authorize sending out absentee ballots for, to all voters and holding it by Australian ballot. We just, the legislature won't make that decision until mid-January. Right. 
And who knows, based on what they've been doing recently, they'll probably say the towns all get to make up their own mind about what they want to do. Who knows? Well, yeah. the question, to, the question that tonight is, and we are not, we are not finalizing the budget tonight, but the question is, what number do we want to put in? And let's have Dorinda put that number in and see where it puts us. And then we've got some time to think about it. We've got a, basically a month to think about this and we can change it. Can I just ask one more question? Yes. Did we, um, I mean, we really weren't through this whole time of budgeting, putting in inflate, like were people really budgeting for a 6% inflation for repairs and for parts and things like that? We were trying um, to. Trying to. Yes. So yeah. they did. Okay. I didn't, I don't really remember that piece. Um, if they were just going by, oh, we'll just raise it up a little bit because we know it's going to cost more. Um, because I think we also need to consider the fact that we might not have budgeted enough in the general budget for just everything, right? They're just, we, we just don't know the cost of some of these goods that we may need to be purchasing. So the only um, thing I would say, Liz, about that is, Looking back at the history of this process over all the years, we almost always, not always, but almost always underspend our budget because we tend to project things high, not low. Now, we don't underspend the wages. Yeah. And certainly in but recent everything else. years, we haven't underspent the mm -hmm. uh, repairs to our road equipment. But overall, when you look at the budget at the end of the year, Sometimes it's $20,000, sometimes it's $30,000, but we tend to underspend our budget. So we're, we're fairly aggressive at the way we, uh, I, I shouldn't say aggressive, I should say conservative in the way we set our tax rate. And I'll just agree with Phil on the whole COLA business. A COLA is not a raise, it's a cost of living adjustment. And, um, and 3% will be effectively um, less than the cost of, of living a year from now. So I think that's what I said, Liz. I know that's what I'm saying. I agree with you. I'm, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> yes. Why don't we have, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mary. Why don't we have, um, Dorinda put in 5% and we'll see what it is. It should be probably or not around another, Ten or eleven thousand dollars, shouldn't it? Over the three percent. Well, if you add the, if, and I, unfortunately I did not print out that worksheet, but if you add the the two percent number she gave us and the three percent number she gave us, the sum of those two numbers, whatever the number is. Yeah. Well, this. Yeah. It, it, so it's ninety six and and fourteen four. So it's about ten thousand more. But that would be much more than 9.32. I don't know what that percentage would be. 10.01. Yeah, we're gonna be over we're gonna be over 10, and we haven't we haven't dealt with the health insurance yet either. So but I I just you know the the whole question is, you know, how are the I mean, we're trying to come up with what we think is the right thing for the town. But the ultimate question is, are the voters going to support this or not? I mean, historically, um, the voters have always supported us, but uh, we have never proposed an increase like this before. That's for darn sure. But they're all dealing themselves with the, um, with the, problems with inflation and every single thing they're buying or paying for. I mean, you can't escape it, especially if you're doing fuel to, to uh, heat your house. Mm -hmm. Peter Dexter's had his hand up for a while. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dexter. Go ahead. Well, thanks. Uh, I didn't come to comment on budget, but it's an interesting discussion. I just thought it may be, and I'm not sure how you schedule your COLA raises versus other raises, but maybe you could plan on a 3% COLA in 
COLA raise immediately at when the budget started and then allow another 2%, you know, up to the 5% level to be, you know, more of a merit raise thing partway through the year. And then if it was halfway through the year, you'd only have to budget for half of that amount. It might be a way to soften the blow in the budget and still meet the objectives of the board. That's yeah. all. Thanks. So, so just to be, just to be clear in my, in my memory, we have never said what portion of the raise was COLA and what portion of the raise was merit. And the other thing we have, we have never done, which, you know, we maybe should be doing, but we never have is give individual merit raises. We've always, you know, everybody's gotten the same raise and whatever portion of it was COLA was COLA and whatever else there was, if there was anything left was, was merit, but it's not like, it's not like we have divided it up in the past, but potentially we could, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you, you just touched on something that I was going to, that I had my hand up for Peter is, yeah, is really, is really looking at, uh, uh, COLA much differently than the raises. Um, and I know from conversations that the budget committee has been having, that's, that's some of the conversation that we've been having um, in house. It, it just, you know, you guys just went through a huge market adjustment. Um, if that's what we want to call it. Um, I think that that is different than this cost of living. And even further than that experience people going and getting any kind of certifications, going through trainings, you know, operating different pieces of equipment, all of that kind of stuff is really performance-based. And that's where the merit step, step increases come into play. Yep. So I, I think that, I think that it would be extremely beneficial for, for you folks to entertain the idea of looking at the way that we've done things in the past uh, differently moving forward. Well, I don't disagree with you on any of that. And we've, we've certainly talked about it. The, the question is, here we are in budget time and how do we implement that now and how do we build it into our budget? Um, and that's a huge challenge. And whether we're, whether we're ready to jump into that world right now or not, uh, I don't know. But I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I, I've, I've dealt with personnel administration most of my life and I've struggled with things like that for years. And you have, you know, you, you have criteria and you say, okay, if you, you achieve this or get that certification or do this or that, you get this increased corresponding increase in pay. But um, it's definitely, it's definitely something that, you know, for this budget year is, is kind of out of reach, but looking forward and incorporating that type of a process into next year's uh, budgeting process and doing the work ahead of time. I mean, the, the trains kind of passed the station for this year um, as, as far as making those types of changes. But I, I know it is something that the budget committee has been discussing and, and um, just hearing the conversation, uh, it felt like, felt like just kind of making that statement to look at for the future was, was appropriate. And I don't, I don't disagree with you, Victor. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I was just wondering, I don't, I don't disagree with Phil or Liz um, or anybody. It's just, uh, we have a pretty fortunate group as far as income goes right here tonight. But there's a lot of people in town that, you know, are retired. And I'm pretty sure that they're not going to get a five or six percent cost of living increase. So, I mean, I don't know what you, you know, I think we should, I think you guys ought to take that into consideration because probably the budget, whatever you put in there, probably the budget will pass, but it's going to hurt some of the lower uh, income people. And I don't, no question. I don't know. Was, I mean, it's got to be a middle point there somewhere. Uh, yeah, I would think. But again, as we've, you know, we've had the 
we've had the bitter pill lesson this year about what we have to do to hire the people we need to hire and get them in place. And I, I don't know, <laughs> honest to God, I, I really don't know what the answer is. Usually, usually those of you who've worked with me over the years know I have, usually I have some kind of an opinion on this and I'm, I'm stuck on this one. Um, but I guess what I'm, what I'm recommending to, uh, to bring this part of the budget discussion to a close tonight, otherwise we're gonna be here until 10 o'clock at night, is that we, we plug in the 5%, and we'll all have a chance to look at those numbers and think about it and also think about what everybody has been saying and the budget committee can think about it and uh, we'll have some more discussion on this before we, before we finalize the budget. The other thing I have not done is spend any time and I don't think there's a lot of money there, but undoubtedly um, if, we go, if we go down through this budget, we can certainly find 25 to $30,000 somewhere. Um, you know, that's, that's a painful, painful process to do, but, uh, we pretty much, a lot of these numbers we put in are, are the numbers that people gave us for their budget. We haven't had any discussion about what could you do if we needed to trim your budget. Yeah, Randy. Do we have a sense of what outliers still remain? I know Dorinda, uh, did some work, uh, in the last, um, uh, uh, working budget that she provided. Um, and she provided us something today. Are there a lot of missing um, numbers to, still to come in, Dorinda? Um, for the most part, I, there's a few, but I don't think it's going to be huge numbers. I plugged in a placement, um, like one of them is county tax. We never get that till the you know very late. Um, but there's a few. There's there's a handful at the most. Um, there is two different line items, and again, they're not big ones, but under um, recreation, there was, we had started a fund last year of $500 to go to the facility maintenance. There was no number budgeted for that this year. And under our grant match, um, we had discussed at the last meeting about kind of going back and looking at that one because I think we only plugged in a thousand dollars for that. And um, I know in the past it's cost us more than that. Um, let's see, future grant match, we put 2,000 in. And I think right now we have, um, let's see if I can find it. Um, was last year's like $19,000, $18,000 or something like that for grant matches? Is that what I saw somewhere? Well, I mean, we had that, we've got one that is a, right now there's one that has to be done by 12-31-22, and that's a $3,000 match. Um, there's another one that is, uh, that one's completed. Let me see, we have that one. We have a scoping study, which is gotta be done by 2023 and that's a $6,000 match. Um, so there's a few here, but again, some of this is in, if it's a highway thing, it's an in-kind thing. Um, and I will say, I think it was the scoping study because it was a loan that was, because it was a grant from the current year budget, I think we put that amount into the current year budget. So depending on when we collect it, right. it might fall to our bottom line before we're able to get reimbursed for it. So it really is a, and last year we also incurred a, at least two grants that I know of that came after we completed our budget. Right. I don't disagree that maybe we should. I mean, here's what I'm saying, guys. We're going to take one last careful run through all these all these things, and they're going to undoubtedly be some minor adjustments. But compared to this COLA question and the health insurance question, which we haven't even talked about yet, they're pretty small money. I'm not saying that you know, $3,000 in grant match isn't, isn't a significant number, but when you look at the total budget, it isn't very, 
isn't very earth shaking. So, you know, we'll we'll do the best we can to fine tune all those numbers, Randy, at the at the end of the at the end of the process, as well as look for savings wherever we can uh, wherever we can find it. But I would like to, and and if 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 five percent is the wrong number, and people would rather look at another number, let's look at another number. But let's let's pick a number and get it plugged in there and move on to the to the health insurance discussion and uh, keep moving forward unless somebody has more comments or discussion that they want to do now. Because we really will be here till uh, 10 o'clock tonight if we're not careful. Maybe not 10, maybe nine o'clock tonight. <laughs> Late. Past, past my dinner hour and perilously close to my bedtime. <laughs> Peter, will, the, will this be discussed on the meeting on the 4th or will it be a later meeting, the budget? So when would we final? My memory is it's the second meeting in January where we finalize the budget. Is that not correct? I think so. Because I won't be here on the 4th. That's why I wanted to check. Isn't that correct, Dorinda? Second meeting in January? Um, it, it all falls to when we have to have our stuff in for the town report. And I, that would be um, like she sent out, Sarah sent out a memo today that the people who have to write items for the town report have to have them in by the beginning of January, like the 5th or something. But when do we have to have this completed by? January 20th. 20th. Yeah. That that town report stuff is if I don't if I give people I've got to be able to put it all together. So those reports don't and the budget committee gets a little leeway because they have to wait to see what the town does with the budget. But um yeah, the the this is this is the issue with the legislature is that the legislature is not meeting about this topic until the 15th of January and uh, we have to warn, you have to warn where the meeting, how the town meeting is going to be held, whether it's not going to be at Rumney School, if that's even going to be allowed, or if it's going to be by Australian ballot. So we got a lot of deadlines, weird tight ropes to walk. But I think, I think finalizing the budget, the second meeting and. That's usually what you do. And yeah. yes. Yeah. So is 5% the number or does somebody want to throw out another number? Uh, I'd like to see the 5% having proposed it, so. Yep. And I kind of second. <laughs> yeah, Peter, I'm good with that 5% also. Okay, Liz? Yeah. 5%? She's nodding her head yes. Yes. So I would say, I would say to Rinda, we're going we're gonna to plug in the... Plug in the five percent. And then it's ten point ten point oh one. Yep. Five uh, percent. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now, uh, and you may have some other items, Dorinda, but the other the, the other significant item I'm aware of we need to discuss is this issue of. Um, how we're handling uh, spousal health insurance for our employees. And as I think almost everyone knows, we have uh, avoided, violated, whatever the right word is, our, our current personnel policy. And we are now uh, compensating uh, people for spousal health insurance, two of our employees, and the third employee where they would not be or, or they are not currently uh, getting any kind of compensation for that uh, is out in the cold right now. And I think what we have been doing is marching down the path of the idea is that to be competitive out there in the workplace, uh, we need to be providing uh, spousal health insurance benefits. Right now, we pay 50% of the cost of spousal health insurance. So when we pick up the other 50%, it's like an additional $330 per employee per month, Dorinda. 
something like that. Yeah. I mean, within, I mean, a, within, a dollar, within a dollar or two. Right. So, the, the premium is six thirty seven a month. So yeah, yeah. three fifteen. And then we also we also pick up uh, potentially the additional cost of the of the HSA uh, contribution for the for the spouse as well. So, you know, my my thought on this subject is that we would a between now and July first correct amend our uh, personnel policy and b budget an amount of money. Uh, sufficient to sufficient to cover that cost as of July uh, as of July first, and to the best of our knowledge, uh, in a, we have promised to two of our employees that we would figure out a way to do that or continue to compensate them, um, and we have a third employee uh, who right now is out in the cold is the wrong word, but not receiving the same. Uh, the same level of benefits. So I don't know how everybody feels about this. It's another, it's, it's a significant, uh, it's a significant cost. Uh, we're talking about basically uh, to cover all three, fully cover all three spouses. We're talking about roughly a thousand dollars a month plus, plus some money for additional HSA contribution as well. So it's a, it's probably what a fifteen thousand dollar thing to do something like that. Just for three, yeah, for the three employees, yes. For the three, yes, Randy. I uh, just want to make the comment that as you guys uh, have this discussion, uh, we really need to be thinking worst case scenario and assume that everybody that we employ that would be eligible for this service could potentially have uh, a spouse even though they may not now, could change next week. Mm -hmm. Yes, it could. The other, the other issue, and, but I disagree. It's, I mean, historically, we've never had a situation where everybody had spouses. So whether you project, you know, if we're talking about five people, whether you project five or four or, you know, who knows what. The uh, other, as we, as we the other piece to... of this, just let me finish for a minute, Randy. The other, the other piece of this I, if we, I think we have to think about is of what, if anything, are we going to uh, give people who elect not to take our health insurance? And that is definitely a big savings if that happens. But what's the what's the appropriate amount of money to compensate them? Because from time to time, there are people where where they can go on their spouse's health insurance at some cost or maybe some minimal cost, and that obviously is potentially a huge savings for us. So to give them an incentive to do that uh, makes some sense. But I would like to, I would like to incorporate that. Whatever we do, I'd like to incorporate something in our budget cost to cover that and and agree what what that benefit would be. Do we have a buyout option currently? Yes, eighteen hundred dollars. It's basically this what close to what they get put into their HSA, nothing towards the premium. And the only other thing that I was going to say, Peter, uh, to that effect was that as we become, uh, you know, more attractive of an employee or an employer, I mean, um, and let's just say we do have turnover there, you know, in, just because historically we've we haven't had people that have had spouses, it, the opportunity is there. Oh, I, Randy, I I I totally understand. But what we've also seen is that to compete in the marketplace, when we're trying to hire people, people we're competing against are more and more covering spouses. So to be competitive, I mean that's what that's what's gotten us in the position we're in basically i'm not i'm not making an argument against this mm -hmm. i'm just saying the potential impact we as we as we explore these options we need to be looking at what the potential impact is and not necessarily just what it is today yeah. I'm, I'm not arguing against it i just want to make sure that people 
people aren't isolating themselves to today's situation. Right. Right. But the cost of uh, who knows. So the question is, I guess what I'm what I'm suggesting, the long and the short of this is, I'm suggesting for tonight, for tonight, we plug that fifteen thousand dollar cost in, and then we're going to talk about it again in January. Unless anybody disagrees with that. No, I think plug it in. We may as well see, you know. The worst case scenario as far as impact. Yep. Yes, um, yep. I, I I agree, Peter, that we should plug that in. And just like Bill had said previously, you know, we dug ourselves out of a big hole. And, and I know this is all coming at once, and we're all trying to figure out how to keep this budget down. But at the same time, we don't want to go backwards. Right. Well, and the other, the other piece of this is, which I really don't want to be doing, is getting forced in a position where we have to, I keep using the word violate, but I'm not sure what the right word is, but violate our personnel policy to be able to hire people. That's, that's bad practice. Mm -hmm. So, what? you know, it's a two-pronged, it's a two-pronged, uh, it's a two-pronged problem. Yep. It's, easy to, it's relatively easy to change the personnel policy, but you live with the consequences of whatever decision you make, obviously. Peter? Yes, Mary. When, when you say um, amend the personnel policy, are you talking about deleting siblings? Or are you talking about something else in terms of what we're doing? We're talking about about for spouses, instead of paying 50% of the cost, we would pay 100% of the cost. I understand that, but I mean, we are currently in non-compliance about paying or not paying for the spouse. Am I correct? Well, <laughs> Under our on, as Dorinda pointed out to me this morning, it depends on on how you consider that bonus money that we've that we've paid to a few of our employees, that money was intended to compensate them for that for that cost. But we are still we are still deducting the amount of money from the employees' pay. Yes, right now. But which also has which also has ramifications because of the way the bonus money is taxed and the way that cost trickles down through our various other fringe benefits compared to. If it's a premium payment, it's actually a little bit of a discounted, a little bit of discounted dollars, but not so, huge. So that money wasn't just a sign-on bonus. Well, Randy, there's there's the there's the interesting question. It was intended to compensate them for the fact that they weren't getting spousal health insurance at this time. So is that a sign on? It certainly was not a direct payment for health insurance. Okay. Yep. So I guess you could you could call it a sign on bonus. You could call it whatever kind of bonus I guess you want to call it. But that's well, what the numbers it is. It's not a direct. We did not start. We did not start paying that fifty percent of the premium. No. And that so I guess where my where my head goes with this is you know we're talking about a six thousand dollar. Uh, bonus, and we just looked at the numbers for a fifty percent spousal, which was what thirty eight twenty two or something like that. Um, so, so to me, if if it was intended to to cover healthcare costs, then we're paying almost double that. And granted, some of it's in taxes and all that kind of stuff, but but we're exceeding the healthcare uh, premiums that it would take to have their their spouse covered for the other fifty percent. Maybe. I mean, the question is, what did we need to do to hire these people? And, and also, when do we get, I mean, we, we had a discussion uh, this morning about, do we, do we square this up a year from this July? And the problem is, that leaves, that leaves the one person who doesn't currently have that situation 
waiting for another 18 months. Um, I'm just, I am very anxious to get this situation squared away. And yes, you know, does that mean that more of that money was sign on bonus and, you know, this and that? Absolutely. I mean, we, we did a sloppy job of, uh, of implementing this and I'll be the first one to admit it, but I think we've got to, our intent was to provide this benefit. So I think we need, my feeling is we need to step up and do it, but um, can we defer it sometime? Can we potentially do the bad thing, which is to give that other employee some kind of a bonus to offset some of that cost? Sure we could, but I kind of hate to do that. Okay. Yes, Dorinda. Uh, can I get a clarification on the HSA? So we are giving the employee 1850 and the spouse previously was 500 um so is the spouse going up to 1850 undecided well you want to put number plugged in i got to know what to plug So if what we're saying is it's a separate issue, I guess. I don't know what we do about the HSA. Yes, Steve. Uh, Dorinda, is that that's an annual the HSA the figure you just said? Um, yes, that's an annual. We pay it in two installments. We pay it on January, the first payroll in January and the first payroll in July, yeah. but it is an annual thing. Okay. Peter, I'm, I'm, I guess I would be saying, let's, let's plug this, these numbers in for that insurance and the HSA, and let's see, you know, we're going to have to have that other discussion, but to see where this comes. And I want to remind everybody, and I've said this before, and but this this town votes in over seventy thousand dollars in special articles. And what we're trying to do is for the benefit of the town. All of these employees that we're we're trying to keep up, these are people that are working for the town for the benefit of everybody in the town. So, you know, I understand that we're we're. We don't want to just keep throwing money out there, but we spend, and it's voted in every year, over $70,000 in special <laughs> articles. So yeah. um, I'm saying let's plug these numbers in and, and we can have that discussion, but we need to plug something right. in. Well said, Steve. I, I was thinking along the same lines that I think it's time to look at the special articles. This might be a good year to, to do that. Well, I was thinking about that too, making it harder instead of easier, but. <laughs> yeah. Man. Uh, well, the good, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see when we are proposing whatever our increase is, whether it's nine, 10 or 11%, whatever it comes out to be, um, maybe that will cause our, our voters to look a little harder at some of those special articles. Um, uh, I, I would tell you, you know, we don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of control on what happens on the special article front. Well, we do if we make it harder to get on the ballot in the first place. Well, that's true, but we've already we've already crossed that river. And how do you? I mean, the only way you can make it harder is make everybody get a petition that I know of. But anyway, so is this is the said yes, Dorinda? Uh, the number is ten point seven six, I believe. But just doing this quickly, so. That's okay. with special articles. No. No, no, no. No special articles. Okay. That's so that. Seven, six, covering, covering three spouses with an equal HSA, full, the full cost of the health insurance and an equal HSA contribution. Right. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Anything else we need to talk about on the budget tonight, Dorinda? Uh, no, just do you want me to plug in those um, 
the question would be, I can plug in the $500 for the recreation and do you want me to change the grant number? So it's 2000 now? Yep. What do you think? What do you think board and budget committee? Bump it up to four? I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a crapshoot number but it certainly looks like we're gonna have more than two. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, agreed. And I guess, and I guess I'd say plug in that five hundred bucks. I yep. think that was just an oversight. And by the way, plug in the ten thousand dollar a piece bonus for the select board. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for Randy to fall out of his chair. <laughs> so, how much did you say? Four thousand. Yes. Up it up to four thousand. Yes. That's what I'm suggesting, unless anyone disagrees. And I didn't fall out of my chair, Peter, but I started to dial 911 from the heart attack I was having. Okay. <laughs> well, as long as I didn't see you loading your AR-15, Randy, I wasn't too nervous. <laughs> Already loaded. <laughs> okay. Mary said it very well. If we were in this for the money, it would be a different world, but we're not. 11.01. <laughs> Let's see if we can make 15. Just kidding. Okay. No, it will be that with the special articles, probably. Mm. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is no way. There is no way for us to guesstimate, estimate any idea what the grand list is going to do right no i mean the listers have no sense of lister uh, yeah, yeah. Lister. yes right. sir. there's you know i'm not even sure that the grand list uh i mean i i'm a little confused about how we'll even catch up with of uh, this year with the following year so in other words just because because there's all these other there's something else you have to consider it's like where we are with us where we are uh from last year from the previous year when it comes yeah. to our um you know coefficient of dispersal and you know so it's really even if we have a great property increase that this the state may penalize us for last year so it's it's not i'm just talking about education but it affects us as well yeah. so you know. So it's just because the the property the the properties have increased is no guarantee that will be a match for match grand list. Oh no, I understand. Yes, Dorinda. And the other side of it is we have an assessor doing it this year, and not the people who've been doing it in the past. Right. right. So we don't know if that'll have any impact on anything or not. Right. Anything else on the budget? Anyone? I think we're certainly scared me to death. It should. No. Yeah. Anything else, budget committee? I think we're all set. Okay, so let's move on to. Uh, Treasure support, Dorinda. Um, I sent you a budget status. I don't know if anybody looked at it or not looked at it. Um, there is, I mean, we're five months into it. There is several areas that we, you know, are, are areas of concern. Um, and maybe if you can look at that and then you know, when you're looking at the budget, um, that might help you decide if you need to change some of these numbers. Um, legal fees alone are is 272% over, you know, um, at a 272% increase in the budget, so. Yeah. Um, so just going down the list, it's, you know, we know which we can't help, you know, highway repairs and things like that. But 
we're over budget in um, quite a few things. Good news is we're under budget in some things as well, but yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we what are. I always, what I always do is exactly what you said. I, I look through the, I look through the current year's numbers and see how we're doing with what we projected and how that. Right. Well, overall, we're at fifty percent of the budget, so we're a little under where we, we're a little over where we should be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I do have one other uh, one other quick item under the under the budget report, as I think most of the select board is aware, uh, one of the members of the road crew ended up getting two pairs of boots instead of the one pair that he should have gotten. And uh, Victor and Shane and I uh, met last week to talk about a number of items, but among that was the, was the boot thing. And the three of us are saying that, you know, we, meaning me, Shane, Victor, contributed to this, contributed to this problem in some way. I, I do not believe, despite the fact that he says I told him he could have two pairs of boots, I don't believe I ever told him that. I can't believe I told him that. But the fact is, Shane did give him a purchase order for two pairs of boots. And he bought two pairs of boots. So uh, Dorinda's been holding that $160 bill to Lenny's in abeyance. I told her to uh, put it on orders. It was in the orders for today. And we paid for the boots. And I'm hoping we'll put that behind us. Shane has met with the road crew and going over the thing again, that it's one pair of boots in each town fiscal year. It has nothing to do with date of hire and some of the other stuff that was brought up in the process and we're, we're putting that behind us. So for, for yeah. me, I apologize if I caused, caused any confusion on, on, the, on the boot issue. I certainly didn't mean to and, and uh, neither did Shane. So uh, that's my report on that. Yes, Dorinda. My suggestion was we applied it to FY23. I just think we need to make that clear because that was the recommendation. And so. So let it be reflected in the minutes that the treasurer's recommendation was that we apply it to FY23, which means he would get no boots next year. Sounds good. Put one pair away and wait. <laughs> so is there a vote on it or is this just at oh. Peter's recommendation? I think it may for for the year to, to well, adopt are we gonna have are we gonna have i mean dorinda if you want a motion on this let's have a motion and settle this once and for all no, I, am so I, sick did, of food. I, I understand I, but the problem is is i just feel that you know the way it's being presented was you know a little bit different than what went down and I asked if it should apply to 2023. And that wasn't said. That's all I said. And now you've got two people said that's a good idea. You know, I feel it's a five member select board. It's not a two member right, well, or a look, one look, member. Look. Let's stop. Okay. Is somebody willing to make a motion that we make a motion on this subject that we can vote on? So we can uh, put this. I'll move. That 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 the purchase of those boots be applied to fiscal year twenty three. I'll second it. Okay. okay. All in favor of that motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I say no. I say no. Okay. So what applies to twenty twenty three? And we will go back to our, uh, we will go back to our, uh, I mean, I'm telling you, we're going to have some meetings with the, with the road crew because no matter what we seem to do, we can't get out of trouble with them. Listen, if the guy is in need of boots, if his boots fall apart in fiscal year 23, you guys can let him buy a new pair of boots. We I, I, gave him, 
we gave him a purchase order to purchase those boots. I didn't give him the purchase order. I didn't direct Shane okay. to give him the purchase order. He gave him a purchase order. That's all I'm saying. And he went out and used it and bought a pair of boots. And now we're telling him that you, Mr. Employee, were wrong. You shouldn't have purchased those boots, even though we gave you the purchase order. So I know Dorinda feels strongly it should apply to 2023. We voted that it should apply to 2023. So that's what it is. We've decided and it's done. And who's going to deliver that message to him, Victor? Me, I guess. Um, I'll do it. Start. I'll do it. I mean, I mean, Shane was hired on January six. I was in uh, February. I had no idea that he got a pair of boots in November, November or October. Uh, okay, is there a way to renege this? I, I, I don't well, really care. So he needs another pair of boots. What's gonna What's gonna stop? stop each the other two road crew from saying i want a second pair of boots too oh exactly because, because they I will. Clearly I'll stop told, i i read the personnel policy to them and said this means one pair of boots every town fiscal year that to me and shane knows that and they now know it so that that issue was taken care of. The only issue is, is it fair to penalize our employee for a mistake that I think we, the town, made? That's the question. And we voted three to two that that's what we want to do. So unless we vote to rescind that, uh, rescind that, that's what we're going to do. I think it's, I think, I understand Dorinda's point. I hate it when we make mistakes. But we've made a lot bigger mistakes than $160, and I'm sure I'm sure we'll make more, despite our best efforts not to make mistakes. But I really don't want to talk about this anymore. If that's the decision of the board, unless somebody wants to make a make a motion to uh, rescind the previous motion, that's what we're going to do. Steve has a comment. I make a motion to rescind the previous motion. I don't know if anyone wants to second me. I'll second that. Okay, so rescinding the previous motion means then we're going to have to have a third motion to pay for the boots. Do you want to include paying for the boots and you're rescinding the previous motion? Uh, yes, if, if that yeah. if that solves the problem, yes. Okay, and the seconder agrees with that. So now we, yes. need, now we need to vote on this motion, which is to rescind the previously approved motion and pay pay Lenny's for the boots and not penalize the employee. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 I have a question before we vote. It's never been a question of whether we pay Lenny's or not. It's just a question of whether or not um, he's going to get another pair of boots in the next fix, fit. You're fiscal correct, year. Mayor, yes. So I don't understand why we have to have the uh, pay Lenny's because we're going to pay Lenny's. He got a pair of boots. We did pay Lenny's, Mary. We have okay. Well, so why, I misspoke. I, misspoke why, I said pay Lenny's. It's it's whether it's whether we're going to allow him to have uh, a pair of boots in the next fiscal year, which starts July first of twenty two. So. Now we need to vote. So all those in favor of that motion, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. aye. And opposed? Aye. Mary's opposed and Phil is opposed. So now it's three, two, the other way. Are we through with this for tonight or forever? Should be. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, moving right along here. And uh, believe it or not, we're not that far off schedule, which is hard to, uh, hard to believe. We're about 20 minutes behind schedule. Um, reviewing and perhaps modifying the enhanced energy plan. All changes must be made no later than 15 days before the January 4th public hearing. So we do have uh, 
one more meeting to potentially make changes. I did. Uh, your hour. next meeting. This afternoon, rereading the energy plan. Yes, Sarah. Just be clear, your next meeting is the 21st. So you would not yeah, have, you would right, have, to have. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Okay. So if we're going to make changes, we need to make them tonight. I spent, uh, having read it quickly once before, I spent about an hour and a half today going through that and trying to make sure I understand it the best I can. Um, I, I don't know what, I don't know what to say. I don't have any specific recommendations on changes. It's like, it seems like a lot of stuff to me and there's a lot of goals. There are a lot of goals in there and a lot of work that needs to be done. And I just wonder if we're ever going to be able to accomplish all that work. I looked at all the stuff the select board and the planning commission are supposed to be doing. And how are we ever going to find the time to do all that? I don't know. But uh, if it's in the plan, it's a plan. That doesn't mean we're going to accomplish everything that's in the plan. So that's really the only comment I have. Well, have you seen the climate action plan for the state of Vermont? <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> I mean, this reflects a lot of other stuff which is going on in the world around us, not just what's going on in the little yeah. burg, of, burg of Middlesex. And, you know, I think it's a, I think for what it is, it's a well-written document. It's just when I, when I look at, when I look at the work that it's gonna require, I just wonder how all that work or how even a heavy percentage of that work is going to get done. And I certainly have no idea whether we whether it's even feasible that we're going to meet those goals and objectives. So, you know, this gives us by by including this in our town plan, my understanding is it gives us better standing Sandy and Act 250 hearings and other administrative hearings relating to uh, relating to uh, energy proposals in town. Uh, sorry, yes, this is Sandy Levine. My understanding is that the, um, if this is adopted by the town, it would be referred to in energy decisions at the state level that they would be making. So it potentially, it potentially gives us more control about how things are these things are rolled out over time but you know when you sit there and read these goals and objectives are they realistic are they possible you know i don't know but we're just going to have to do our best to do whatever we can do i guess is, is the answer and it's all part of the town planning process it's an so, asper document i'm sorry mary it's an aspirational document i'll say <laughs> yes. i really glanced over it i didn't have time to really read it carefully it's See, really hard how well, you take one piece out and another piece falls i mean it's really hard to think of how you might amend it that's exactly right that's exactly right yes steve uh, <clears throat> peter i i also read the read that from one side to the other and i went back through it again i mean i have, i guess i have questions but i guess for me uh, some of this i really need to try to digest this a little bit more uh before okay. i make any recommendations or or other than one thing that stood out um for me, uh, was one of the things where they were talking about uh, uh, subdivision regulations are revised and adopted or a road ordinance is adopted to discourage further upgrades of class four roads. I, I, I don't think that's a wise thing to put in there in the sense that we have uh, a couple of class four roads in this town that would benefit the town and benefit probably landowners if uh, you know as people build out uh, there's a couple of these class four roads that would that would benefit so you're not going up the road and then back down and then 
going all the way around and doing the other end. It would be beneficial to go straight through. So I, I think something like that, I don't think should be in there. But I again, I, I really need to look at this whole thing again and digest a bunch of this before I make a lot of recommendations. Peter, do you see, do you see Dexter? Yes, Dexter. Hi, uh, I'm Dexter. I guess I don't need to introduce myself. But I'm on the Energy Committee, the Middlesex Energy Committee, and I've been on the Energy Committee for several years. And uh, we've been going through this document um, maybe for almost a year. I think we started in the spring as a committee. Uh, the uh, review of the, the document never really gained traction with the committee. Um, I became really the sole reviewer um, and the, the committee has a number of objections to the uh, plan um, that haven't been addressed. Um, and, uh, you know, personally, I just have concerns about it as well. The committee did not endorse the plan. Uh, the committee felt that it needs more time to really digest it and understand it and, you know, be that known that it's been on the table in front of the committee for nine months, more or less at this point. And, and the committee of people who are, uh, you know, wholeheartedly committed to en good energy policy are ones who, who would make this a priority more than others. And we just haven't had a chance to digest it as a whole. Um, and I think, you know, like what uh, Steve brought up about class four roads, I think that's an example of some of the problems with this, this plan and some of the objectives. And to, to summarize it from my viewpoint, it seems to put you know, energy, uh, renewable energy objectives uh, higher than any other objective. Um, it, it, it overlooks the needs of the individual, uh, the financial needs of individuals, the financial needs of, of towns. Um, and you know, I think it, how that relates to upgrading class four roads um, is a good example. It's basically saying, you know, we've got to make energy energy reduction a priority over uh, people's financial situation and other economic needs. And I just think that that's bad policy. Um, and I also want to mention the, about the state uh, comprehensive energy plan. This uh, Middlesex Enhanced Energy Plan is based on the 2016 state energy plan that is due the new one is due to be upgraded in six years which is 2022 it is to be released in january this plan will be obsolete the data in this plan relies heavily on the 2016 plan and it will be obsolete the day that 2022 report is issued so i think we'd be wise from that standpoint to delay and think about uh, incorporating the latest guidance from the state into the plan. Um, and it goes to, to like uh, what's, what Steve and Peter were saying, was that they, they just didn't have enough time to get through it. I think the Energy Committee, and I'm not here to speak for the Energy Committee, but as a member of the Energy Committee, I think that uh, we'd like more time to really digest these things and have more dialogue with the Planning Commission. Um, so... Just and I just uh, want to make, so my uh, understanding. Yeah. My understanding, Sandy, of the reason for uh, the public hearing January fourth is so this could be voted at town meeting. Is that correct? That's correct. So it could be on the so ballot at town meeting, and we, just if we make the decision, some kind of decision for more time, and certainly. There's time between now and January 4th for any comments or suggested changes. They can come out as part of the part of the public hearing process. Uh, but if that isn't enough time, um, then we're saying, I don't know what we're saying, that we're going to consider it at the general election. Is there is there some is there just hold on a minute, Sarah? Is there some reason, Sandy, other than just a just a goal to get this behind us that we wanted to vote on at a town meeting? Um, the effort was to have it be voted on at a time that we're voting on other things, and that would be either a general election in November or town meeting. And 
secondly, you'll remember this is held over from before we had this, you know, by and large prepared in 2020 and presented it to the select board and did not, because, you know, COVID and other things and everybody was dealing with other things, did not move forward. So we, you know, took a step back, went back, worked with the Energy Committee. Theo was a representative from the Planning Commission, who, in my understanding, he went to nearly all of the Energy Committee um, meetings to work through and, uh, you know, incorporate changes that, that were, were recommended from that group. Um, so, you know, is it, uh, is it already a year older? Yes, it's already a year older than it was um, from when it was originally presented to the select board. Okay. Okay. Other comments, anyone? I had a couple more. Okay, right. Dick, go ahead. But I, I would, if you have, if you have specific changes you'd like to recommend, I would suggest you submit them in writing. I mean, I, I don't know what. I, I know the board's going to make it, might make a decision tonight. And I feel like my comments uh, might be helpful to the board's decision. Go ahead. Uh, the uh, document contains a lot of goals and the goals in the document are um, derived from the 2016 plan. They are taking statewide numbers and um, uh, applying them proportionally to Middlesex. So there is information in the plan like it states that 58% of the energy consumption in Middlesex is commercial. Um, so it's got a lot of numbers in there that just aren't based in reality for Middlesex. They're generic numbers derived from statewide or sometimes regional uh, numbers and they're, they're not valid and they're goals. They're in there as goals. And the concern is, is that um, you know, in Act 250, compliance with the regional plan, with the town plan is a requirement. Uh, it may be true in certain aspects of our town zoning as well. And, and the committee, the energy committee was clear that they did not want energy policy to drive land use policy. And this document clearly links land use pol policy to energy policy. And the last point I want to make about, about uh, the energy committee's request was that compliance with these goals and recommendations be voluntary for the people of the town. Um, and again, as this relates to Act 250, Act 248 and local zoning, uh, these goals become mandatory and the, the, the energy plan can be used as a political weapon to stop development if uh, the development or the town is out of compliance with the energy goals of the plan. And remember, the energy goals of the plan are based on numbers based in 2016 that will be out of date in January of 2022. I think that's all I had. Okay. Thank you for that's allowing me to continue here. No, that's, that's fine. Sir. So just to be clear though, this this is your personal opinion, not an opinion of the Energy Committee. You're not- Yes, the Energy opinion. Committee really didn't have time to consider the report in whole, nor did they have time to develop an opinion as a group. Uh, and we, we met last night and talked about this and they encouraged me to come tonight and, uh, and speak for myself. But can I just clarify, Dexter, when you said they do not endorse it, you don't mean to say that they've looked at it and said, we don't endorse this. They have not yet made a decision to whether or not to endorse it. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. In a perfect world, Dexter, how much time do you need? You've had two years. <laughs> I've been through it, but the rest of the committee hasn't been able to engage. They're not really, the document is really kind of, uh, well, you read through it. It's not the friendliest thing in the world to, uh, it's not like easy reading. Uh, it I'm, really not, I'm not giving you a hard time. I'm just saying if oh. they haven't been able to look at it in two years, what's the likelihood that they're going to look at it in another year? Are we going to be sitting here next, next wow. October in the same place we are now? You know, I guess that goes back, you know, I think that that's a, a, Good question, and I think it's symptomatic of what's going on here. Is that the, the, this is like a state down, a state down, state handed down template that dumps a lot of responsibility on the town, uh, like the energy committee, uh, like our staff uh, that are already working hard um, to do what they need to do, and it's just more, more workload without a without a means 
to uh, to complete it. So, can you imagine if we had to hire staff to 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 implement the plan? How much time would the energy committee, hold on a second, Sarah. How much time would the energy committee need to come up with a specific list of recommended changes? And I know you, you know, you're. I, 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 I'd say three or four months. Uh, we, we went through all the sections um, except for electrical use. Uh, so that'd be the last section we'd have to review as a, as a group. And then we would have to meet and, and uh, see uh, how our comments have been addressed in the current plan. So I think that's at least two meetings for us. We do meet monthly, um, but we have a hard, you know, we have a hard time getting people. It's only three of us last night. Oh, I know the issues. I know the issues. Sarah, yes. Okay. I just want to make sure that the board understands that you don't have to make a decision tonight on this. The last day to notice this is January 28th. So in other words, the board can hold a hearing on the on the 4th of January, as long as you have, as long as it's on the warning or not on the warning, that's the final deadline. So you do not have to make a change. All you have to do tonight is make changes to the plan to within 15, outside of 15 days before the public hearing. That's neither, uh, that's neither, neither accepting or denying the plan. You can do that after the public hearing. Does that make sense? We could also make changes after the public hearing, correct? You can, yes. That's what the public hearing is for. Otherwise, there would be no point in having a public hearing. So I, I guess I guess what I would suggest is that we go ahead and unless people have specific changes tonight, we we forward the plan to the public hearing process as it currently exists and encourage the Energy Committee and anyone else who may be interested in this to come back with suggested changes. And then we're going to have to make a decision after the public hearing whether we're going to go ahead for a town meeting day vote or whether we're going to going to need more time and potentially either have a special election, which I, I always hate special elections, but if the worst case is, if the worst case is it had to wait until uh, next November or maybe the, maybe the primary, I don't know. But anyway, we can make, we can make that decision down the road, but I don't think we're, I mean, I'm not ready to, to recommend specific changes tonight, and I haven't heard the only specific change we've heard is the uh, suggestion from Steve about the class four, uh, the class four roads. Um, well, we did hear a recommendation from Dexter to delay it right now. Oh, I understand, but he didn't have any specific changes. Right. I mean, I just will encourage the, the, the this gives the energy committee some time to focus on this and try and, I mean, I just, anyway, we need to move forward to this, but we don't want to, we don't want to move forward and, and create a problem and make a mistake either. And, uh, you know, I guess the other thing about delaying it, and I'm not sure how, how germane it is, but if this new state energy plan is, is coming out to update this, to be in conformance with the new state energy plan might make some sense. I don't know how different the new plan is going to be from the from the old plan. I have no idea. It's radically different. Sandy, do you have a comment on that? I don't. I I don't. I haven't. I don't know what the new energy plan um, is going to be. Obviously, and I do know that sometimes those get delayed as well. Um, and there's nothing stopping changing this if it needs to change based on the new energy plan when that's adopted. But this is essentially what actions would, um, actions and goals for Middlesex in light of the state's um, energy goals and policies that are both in statute and in the, in the state's energy plan that's been in place since 2016. Well, I guess, I guess what I would suggest is a motion to move forward with a public hearing as, as planned and, and see where we are after that. And I don't know whether it makes sense to delay or not. That gives me some time to think about it and all the rest of us some time to think about it. 
we got well, a lot of plate and a lot to think about, but um, I don't I don't see any reason not to go ahead with the uh, with a public hearing, and we may get some other uh, some mm -hmm. other good comments at the public hearing. Right. So yes, Sarah. What you should do is just uh, is just not make any changes to the plan before the public hearing. That's all you have to do. The public hearing has already been warned at the yin yang, so you're going to have to have it no matter what. Right. Okay. Right. So we don't need a motion. You don't think you need a motion. You just okay. have, you haven't made any changes. If you'd made some changes, you would have had to you would have had to uh, make a motion on okay. those. But you so we don't. So we, don't I would draw. we don't need to take any any action. We just we just don't make any changes now and wait till after the public hearing. That's right. That's the way it's warned. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Anything else on that uh, subject? So now, <laughs> considering the following motion that the public good necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the town of Middlesex require discontinuance of an 832 foot long segment of Dolan Road, such segment being, I'm not gonna read this whole whole thing to you all, uh, got it in front of you. Uh, way behind. <laughs> this, is, this is a way, uh, you know, the end of our, our process, or not the end of our process, but the next step in our process of uh, having this not be a, a, a town road, but be a trail. And again, the reason for the reason for doing this to remind everybody was that if we kept it as a class four town road, we were going to incur significant extra, maybe extravagant expenses to upgrade that road to uh, to meet the required uh, meet the required standards. So by making it a trail, we we dodge that expense, and certainly the condition it's in now, it is it is virtually a trail. It is not a road. So, uh, somebody willing to make a motion on that? We, do we need to have discussion? Where do we stand? I'll make that motion that we uh, have that segment as a trail. I'll second it. No. No, we make the motion that we are discontinuing it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, four. yeah, we, I don't know if this needs to be read into the record. Do you want me to read it really fast so we can Please. just get it into the record? Sure, go ahead. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the the motion would be that for the good public the public good necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the town of Middlesex required discontinuance of an 832 832 foot long segment of Dolan Road, such segment being the class four portion of the highway, which segment is further described as being 190 feet north northeasterly of Dolan Road's intersection with Boldick and Tangled Town Road and proceeding 832 feet on and along Dolan Road in a generally north northeasterly direction. Steve moved to approve that discontinuance and that wording, which I'll put into the minutes. Okay. And Liz, who second? second? I said it. Okay, thank you. So all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I think then it should note also that the select board did a, um, a viewing of the road I forget the date, November 8th, was it? Nobody remembers when we did it. So oh, wait, just, I gotta say something here. So you guys, you also, you were sent the report of findings of the town of Middlesex oh, left yes. board. That's what your, that states, that states the entire procedural history. Yes. So right. what you're gonna do is uh, you, this is when this order here is what you just approved for the good public good and necessity convenience the habits of the blah, blah, blah. Now I just need someone to designate it as a legal trail and then we're done. So can someone yeah. designate so it as one legal more, trail? We need one more, we've, we've discontinued the class four road. Now okay. we need a second motion, which is to reclassify what was formerly the class four section of Dolan Road to a trail. Right. So moved. Thank you, Phil. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Steve, who seconded? Steve? Steve, yes. Yep. Okay. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
Okay. Thank you. All right, you. you guys are just going to need to sign the order and then we can record it and we're done. We'll send it to the state of Vermont. Thank you. Okay, so do we all need to we all need to sign it? Well, you should have, you should. I yeah. mean, okay. I'll leave, I'll leave it out there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Highway report. Victor. Yes, would, would you like to entertain the uh, the body uh, uh, for the new truck, the body and the wing and the plow and the sander uh, that you got? Uh, I assume you got a copy of it today, right? Yes. Yes. And it's for the $86,212. So the, the issue was Shane, Shane called me last week and said, or we all sat to order the equipment on the truck from Tenco. And I said, well, I can't remember exactly what action we took on that. I went back and looked through the minutes. He went back and looked through the minutes and we couldn't find, I know we discussed it, but I don't think we ever agreed that that's what we were gonna do. Initially, we were gonna get a, get a uh, second proposal, which basically didn't work out. We needed to go with Tenco. And I think we had discussed that we would go with Tenco, but I don't think we ever actually took action to do it. So- That's absolutely uh, correct. I wanted to make sure, and considering that when we were gonna have a meeting tonight, I wanted to make absolutely sure that we had it in the minutes that that's what we wanted to do uh, before he, place that order. So that's why it's come before us again. So uh, I would appreciate a motion that we uh, pursue the Tenco uh, proposal for the equipment on the new town truck. Is there someone willing to make that motion? I'll make that motion. Okay, everybody, everybody spoke. We're all excited to, I'll move it, Liz. Okay, and is there a second? So, okay. okay. All in favor, all in favor of accepting the 10 co proposal for the equipment on the new truck, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Good. Uh, what else have you got, Victor? Anything? Um, we got the, uh, we, we finally got the Freightliner back and it's running. I you know, the liner was out for quite a while. Yeah. Yep. And it's back and it's working. So now we have three trucks. We're kind of in. We winter our, and we have our new road crew member at work. Yes, we do. We do. Um, came on, what, a week ago, Monday? A week ago, yesterday? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Steve McLaren. He's learned his route. Uh, he's all good to go. Excellent. All good to go. The problem with the concentra or whoever it is lost his drug test, but we're dealing with that. Um, he went up to get one today, I believe. Yes, I believe he did. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for uh, any questions for Victor? Okay. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Uh, so here we go. The fun, the fun goes on and on. Considering a townwide COVID-19 mask mandate is permitted under special legislation signed by the governor on November 23rd, 2021. Action likely. Comments, thoughts? What do you think? I don't think we need one. You know, I mean, we Red Hen, which is probably the only business in town that has significant traffic, has, you know, mandates, masks. Um, and I'm, I, I'm just not sure there's another business that we have that has that kind of traffic. I don't, I just, I just don't think we need it. Well, I think Roots gets a lot of traffic and the filling station oh, is. Yeah. What? And Roots um, mandates masks. And sticks and stuff. Sticks and stuff would probably be the uh, mm -hmm. potentially the other one. 
I just, well, I just think, I just think that the state really passed the buck to us. If there's, if there should be a mask mandate, it should come down from the state. It shouldn't be a town by town decision. So, I first of all resent that they imposed that on us. Our, our road crew is dead set against a mask mandate in the town garage and the town vehicles. The fire department has written us a letter saying they are dead set against the mask mandate. Sarah has implemented a mask mandate at the town hall. Uh, and the other, the other piece of this is, if we pass this man mask mandate, if we were to pass it, how the hell are we ever going to enforce it? I mean, we've never been able to give out tickets for our dog ordinance or our junk ordinance or any of our other things. And I can tell you, I don't plan on spending my winter going around with a clipboard checking to make sure that people are wearing masks when they go into these places. So I think it's just beyond beyond what the town has the capability to do or enforce. And I think we got to rely on the individual businesses. So I did reach out to Red Hen to ask them um, what they thought about this, if they were in favor of a mask mandate. And they said that they were. Um, they said that it's easier when your business is not an outlier in terms of having a mask rule. Um, and they like the fact that their employees don't have to be, you know, wouldn't have to be, and they still do, you know, have to speak to customers who say to them, why do I have to wear a mask? And that makes it challenging for them. So they are 100, and, according to their email, 110% in favor of a mask mandate. I did send this email to Sarah, but I don't know that she sent it out to you guys. So I just wanted that for the record that Red Hen is 110% in favor of a mask mandate. And that's why I would prefer that it come down from the state and not from us. I mean, what what's gonna happen if we do have a mask mandate? Who's gonna enforce it? It's still gonna be their employees doing it. I mean, they can say- oh, okay. The I'm just board, saying the this is what Red Hen said. It, but who's going to enforce it? Uh, yes, Victor. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I agree with you uh, from a different aspect. It's pretty hard to uh, legislate personal responsibility. Hey, nobody's saying you don't. Nobody's saying you can't wear a mask. And and you know, as far as uh, you know, as far as uh, uh, it, it's your own personal uh, responsibility. Uh, if, uh, to wear a mask if you want to uh, protect those around you and yourself. So I don't see any reason for uh, mandating it because, like you said, nobody, nobody, there's nobody to enforce it. I also read some articles about, or I didn't. I'm sorry. This I heard this article on the radio from an epidemiology standpoint that the mask mandates work when they're statewide because exactly. everyone has to do it and that there's no sort of reason to believe that a town by town is going to have any effect because you'll go to the next town. I mean, I go to Barry, no one wears a mask in Barry in the stores or half the, half the people do, right? So, you know, that's not protecting the greater good of the citizens of Vermont by having a mask mandate. I'm all in favor of masks and I'm all in favor of mask mandates, but not necessarily on where the towns are required to make those individual decisions. I think that probably has little effect on a town our size. And I think, honestly, if anything, it's going to cause more um, divide among regular townspeople than cause actual preventing of deaths, which masks do help with. Um, so I, that's where I'm coming from. Other comments? Someone raise your hand. Yeah. So Hi, I'm Chelsea. I am a resident of Middlesex and I just hopped on um, about this mass mandate. You know, even if it does come down from the state, nobody's people are going to make their own decisions about wearing the mask. So I definitely agree that having the town do their own mass mandate isn't going to make a difference on 
if people wear the mask or if they don't wear the mask. That's just what I've seen and what my opinion is. And I work in Williston. So, you know, I, I definitely see the different, um, different people wearing masks or not wearing masks. And it just, it all depends on their comfortability with society, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Sarah. Chelsea, I need your last name. It's Sharky. Sorry. Okay. That's fine. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Chelsea. Other comments? I see you uh, zoomed in, Sandra. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Red Hen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it it's it's truly a tough one. I mean, and I I I kind of think we should have a statewide mask mandate, but that doesn't provide any any enforcement either. Um, but I would say when we had the statewide mask mandate, there were a lot more people wearing masks than there are now. But I think a lot of that has to do with people just being sick and tired of wearing uh, wearing masks. It's interesting. It's interesting in Montpelier. Most people seem to be wearing masks inside. Most people, not everyone, but most people. And uh, I agree in Barry, it's a different world over in Barry. It seems to be a little bit of a different world in Waterbury. So I don't know. I don't know. But I guess if, if, no, one, uh, if no one wants to make a motion that we implement a mask mandate, we're not gonna implement one. So uh, Chris has his hand raised. Excuse me? I saw that Chris has his hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Chris. You're muted, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would be in favor of mask mandate, even though it is not enforceable, just as a statement that we think it's important. Um, and, you know, it would help the red hen out because then it's, we're doing it not to be standoffish or, um, but we're required to do it, even though they're doing it already. The other rationale of saying it's not gonna make a difference, I don't think we would apply that to our energy policy. If we have an individual town and energy policy designed to help with the uh, global warming and the climate change, uh, you know, a lot of towns are acting individually uh, with the understanding that it is, however incremental, is gonna make a difference. So I, I, I think it can be an important political statement to make, even though it's not enforceable. I understand it's not enforceable um, in, in any practical way, um, but some people will respond to it just because it, the town said to do it, um, it's the ordinance here, and it just gives a, a little bit of a nudge to folks who might not otherwise use a mask. Yeah. Thanks. So let me, ask, let me ask you all this. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. I just want to get into the record that uh, Jeff Coons speaking as, I think I sent you that email today, Jeff Coons speaking as a resident uh, was also opposed, opposed to the mask mandate. Let's get yeah. that out there. So I've been thinking about this and the question is, is there possibly middle ground here? Like, can we have a resolution that the town of Middlesex recommends <laughs> mask wearing indoors? It's not, not an ordinance, it's not a mandate, it's a recommendation. I mean, does that meet some of, some of Chris's thoughts and some of the thoughts of the Red Hen? Give them a little, give them a little uh, support or, or backup without having, a, without having a mandate? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's just an idea I have. I see Mr. Here, JJ has a question and then Dexter. Yep. Uh, thanks for taking my comment. Uh, JJ Van Det. Um, I live in Center Road, a new resident of town. Um, I am just here to express my opinion that we should not have a mask mandate. Uh, Red Hen is doing a good job as they are. I'm in there. I have a little bit of an espresso addiction. I'm in there often. And um, they, they are people walking without masks. They ask them to put it on. I've seen no conflict over it. And I'm in there three to four days a week. Uh, I also frequent Roots, get a lot of my vegetables at Roots. They have great organic vegetables, mask mandate adhered to, no problems there. When I go to sticks and stuff, got a lot of work to do in this old farmhouse, no masks, no problem there. 
So the businesses are doing fine as it is, no additional regulation, no additional hurdles, no questions about how to enforce this. Less is more in this instance. That's my opinion and I hope you consider it. Thanks. So nobody picks and stuff wears a mask. Is that what you're once saying? A, uh, they don't have a requirement and I re I've been in there probably once a week for the past few months. You see them rarely at sticks and stuff, which is people wear them if they want to, and they don't if they don't, which is, um, you know, their preference. Dexter. Yeah, I just want to, you know, really take the same stand as JJ. Um, I, I don't support a mass mandate. I think that the current situation that businesses in town are doing is working quite well. Um, I think this is something that should be voluntary. I also want to point out that uh, it seems like a one select board member reached out to one business and is using that as, as a basis uh, to suggest that the mandate is desirable by business. And I'm just going to state that there are many other businesses that have not been contacted and haven't had the equal opportunity to share their opinion and that I, I would not advise uh, putting a lot of weight on that one piece of uh, information. Thanks. So what is everyone, what about the idea of making it a recommendation? Sandy, Can I speak to that, okay. Peter? Um, thank you, Sandy Levine. Um, I will say I found it helpful when the Planning Commission held a public hearing and there were members of the public present for to be able to say it's the town policy to have a mask within the town offices. There were people there, no idea who they were, no idea what vaccination status was and so on. It just, I felt it equalized um the ability of people to participate and to participate safely in in town government so i guess i would support to the extent you can continuing a policy to have mass within within the town well i think i think we are and correct me if i'm if i'm incorrect on this sarah but but the plan is that in the town hall the policy is going to be masks are on so not in the fire department, not in the town garage, but in the town hall. Yes, sir. Well, as, as speaking as town clerk, I can only control the town clerk office. I can't control all of town hall. That's that's the select board uh, uh, purview. When I mean, the town clerk policy is that in people coming into the town clerk's office need to wear a mask for all sorts of reasons, the least of which is that we've got tiny space. And I don't know who's, you know, what vaccination status is going on, you know, here, I'll be quite frank with you and tell you that when we don't have people coming in, uh, when it's Dorinda, uh, Cheryl, Eric, and, and myself, we don't wear masks because, you know, I'm boosted, you know, Dorinda's boosted, we're all, I, we all feel very comfortable in what we have, but so I don't want to wear masks all the time, but on the other hand, I don't know who's coming in, I could have, I had a guy come in the other day, someone we know and love in town who doesn't have uh, who had COVID last month, who is, has not been vaccinated, who will not be vaccinated. He came in without wearing a mask. I have to worry about a 99 year old person living on my street coming in and whether or not she's vulnerable. Therefore he has to wear a mask. Did he wear a mask? No, but you know, I have at least, I don't have any problem kicking people out ever on situations like that. So, but you guys have to control town hall. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but when, I mean, potentially that potentially that that's an easy one. We can adopt a policy which says our, our policies that says in the town hall, you wear a mask. But that isn't that isn't a town wide mandate, which pertains to all the businesses in town. And yeah, but I can I can tell you that Dorinda, I'm, I'm not going to follow it if I'm the only one in the town hall or if I'm there with uh, Dorinda. Well, alone. I was about to say that. So so how do we uh, how do we deal with that? It's it's you've got to make personal responsibility thing, I guess. I don't know. If you make the policy that it's that it's uh, mandated that you wear a mask here, then even the folks working here have to wear a mask here. That's it correct. can't be it correct. can't be selective. No, and, no, no. I, I agree. I mean, that's, I, the, that's the that's the problem. So. Uh, I'm firmly against a mask mandate. I believe it's personal responsibility myself, and and I agree with Dexter and and JJ. Um, those businesses that are that are asking people or have their own policies, they're handling it well. 
let's leave it at that. I do believe less is more here to follow up with JJ. Can we pass over it and just not vote on it at all? Yeah. Yes. Would you like to uh, make the motion that we pass over, Liz? <laughs> just wondering. I don't know that I'm ready to do that right this second. Okay. Uh, uh, comments or questions? I, yeah. I move on. that we pass over the um, townwide COVID uh, mask mandate. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that, Peter. Okay, Steve. So it's been moved and seconded that we pass over uh, the mask mandate question. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? I don't think we heard from Liz and Mary. You're abstaining, Mary? Liz is abstaining. Yeah, I'm opposing. Oh, okay. You're opposing, and Mary's abstaining. So well, three. Oppose it too. I oppose it, but uh, yeah, I'll oppose it. Okay, so we have we have three uh, voting in favor of passing over it, and two and two opposing. So the uh, so the motion passes, and we passed over the article. Not to say we can't take it up again in the future, right. but right. that's what we decided for tonight. Um, okay, here's a good one. Considering the <laughs> school's request, WCUUSD's request, that the town mail out the WCUUSD ballots for the March 1, 2022 school meeting to all active registered voters, all five towns in the school district must agree to this action likely. Did we get any... Uh, update on what's going on in the other towns, Sarah, by any chance? Yes. So here's what we know so far. We know that last night, Berlin just did what you did with the TAT mask mandate. They passed over it. So they didn't make a decision. Their next meeting is the um, uh, is after the deadline for, uh, for the, the school district's deadline to have a re response to, to this. And uh, Berlin, uh, East Montpelier voted in favor and so did Worcester and uh, Callis has yet to take it up. They have a meeting next Monday. And the decision needs to be made by the 15th. And it has to be unanimous. So if, if, uh, if Berlin has voted to pass over and there's no time for them to reconsider, it's not a unanimous decision. So it's not gonna happen. Right. Um, um. Is Chris McVeigh still on? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have all the face. I am. I am. And we're just hoping that you will um, vote on it one way or another. Who knows whether Berlin will have an emergency meeting just to address this. It's a little surprising and disappointing that they did pass over it just because it makes it easier, I think, all around uh, to have a uniform method of mailing out the ballots. But didn't you say East Montpelier... Oh, passed I, it. Passed, passed it. Yeah. Passed okay. It. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. Approved. They will. Yeah. They will mail. So, Chris, um, don't 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 we need an emotion that you're going to pay the cost of doing that? Uh, I, I saw your letter saying you were going to do it, but it's not part of the motion, is it? Um, it's not, but I, I hope we're dependable enough that we'll do what we say we're going to do in terms of paying the cost. I think. You know, we, they, we send a form to to the town clerk and then they tally up what they um, have expended and, and then we pay. I think that's happened last year. Is that right, Sarah? Yep. That is was there, any problem, was there any problem getting paid? Uh, with the, I'm trying to remember. I, th I think there was an issue. Um, I'm sorry, Peter, for speaking out of turn. But um, okay. the uh, I think there was an issue about labor one of these years, there was an issue that might have been 2019 when we had all those special elections and we started charging the school district because we had so many costs involved with, I think, four or five special elections. But as for 2020, um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I'm trying to, figure, it's, you know, it's such a blur because I don't know what the state paid for, et cetera. Dorinda knows. 
Dorinda's got her hand up. Yes, Dorinda. Well, I was going to say, I thought COVID money covered the mailing. Didn't it, it covered the right? mailing from 2022. I'm still dealing with the, with, I'm referring oh, to the with, 2019 with, when we had those special oh, elections. We started yeah, charging. I don't know. I was talking about last year. They yeah. covered it. Yeah, there was a problem one year. And, right. Um, well, I guess the only question I have, Chris, and, and, you know, help me out here is, why should it be the town's responsibility to do this? Um, because I think it it makes it a more uniform process. Um, and my my impression is that the town clerks got together as a group and talked about this a year or two ago. Sarah, is that correct or not? Or am I just so, not remembering? So the bottom line is that schools, school districts have no authority to administer elections, period, full stop. Something we've gone through repeatedly since 2019. We used to be the Middlesex Town School District, and I was theoretically the clerk of the Middlesex Town School District. And therefore, the relationship between running a school election and uh, was much clearer. And it has not, the legislature hasn't caught up, the Department of Education hasn't caught up, the Secretary of State's office hasn't caught up. So basically, town clerks are in charge of running school elections. The issue is, as always, because we have a merged school district, we all have to act in the same uniform way. And so we can't have people voting, if the, you know, coming in and asking for absentee ballots. It's got to be uniform because we've got these five, we've got these five towns merged into one school district. If you do decide to mail all ballots, I would do what I think East Montpelier is going to do. And that is I would just turn over a checklist to uh, East Montpelier, to um, jet service and let them print and mail all the ballots. And, you know, the school district can send their, their ballot, which they format, they can send it to jet service. I wouldn't do anything except receive the ballots when they're returned and put them in the, to the, into the box. There's also something to consider that we may have a, another school election involving the Barry, the career center divert, divert, divesting or whatever from Barry town school district or the Barry city school district. So that is going to be an added complication. And in that case, again, all the towns, we've got many, many, many more towns than the five towns have to also agree in the same voting method. So this is a pretty complicated situation. So what I'm hearing is we should do it. I'm not making any recommendation, but Dorinda has her hand up. Dorinda. Um, I just have a question. That I don't know if it's even relevant to this, but the school district is asking us to do this, but yet we are asking the school if we can hold our election in their building. And um, from what I understand, we're getting a little bit of kickback from that, that that may not be possible. And so, I just find it kind of ironic that we're asking to do this portion of it, but yet we can't hold our election there. I, I don't know if there's any comment on that or not. You, you mean election? Oh, the the, the, town 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 the annual town meeting that we've asked if we can use the school. We haven't gotten a definitive answer, but the rumor mill is that they're not, unless we bring in a, cleaning crew at nine o'clock at night to clean the school or something like that. I mean, so I just find it kind of, you know, like things go two ways. So Dorinda, I have a meeting with Jen Miller Arsenal tomorrow morning at nine okay. and we will discuss this. And I will point out that um, the town of Middlesex has an easement over the school property that we put in place before the merger. Uh, okay. that provides for um, access. But that being said, there probably is a significant concern, concern about the COVID, um, you know, and, and, you know, they're looking out for students and teaching and staff and things like that. So, but I, I will get back to you folks after I meet, um, or I'll get back through, through Sarah after I meet with Jen um, Miller Arsenal tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you, Chris. I mean, the, the irony of this is that the legislature can have a special session to pass this mask mandate thing, but why didn't they take up the issue of town meeting and how that was going to be conducted at their at their special meeting? It's just irresponsible to me that we're not even going to know what they're going to do until after January 15. And at the same time, 
we may or may not be able to use the school. How the hell are we going to have a town meeting if we can't use the school? We're going to have to put up a tent somewhere. I mean, I, I don't know. It just, it's frustrating to me that we can't get, uh, can't get clear, can't get clear direction on this, but we've got what we've got, I guess. But yes, if you could get back to us, that would be, uh, okay, that would I be will. Good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, so where does that where does that leave us on the uh, on the ballot issue? I think we should do it. As Sarah said, it's not going to be a tremendous problem for her to do it, and uh, it has to be done uniformly. And um, I, I just think that uh, we shouldn't, even though I think we're we want to use that building. I just don't think that we should withhold the ability of us to do something that we can do easily. And I'm not even certain, although Chris didn't address it, that they have the capability to do a uh, townwide um, mailing themselves. But I, I agree money that solves, if, money <laughs> solves all problems, Mary. I'm sorry. Money. I just, said, I just made the snarky remark that money solves all problems. That's all. I. The other thing is that if the statute says that they don't have the authority to do uh, elections, that it, it makes sense for us to support having elections that are valid elections for the places where our kids go to school, even though if we have different other issues. I agree. I agree. So are you willing to make that motion, Mary? May, can, may I, before you get going, I just want to just raise some another issue. We're going to have, you're going to have if you vote to have all the school ballots mailed and let's say town meeting is held in person, it's going to be, it's going to, we're, we're going to have a really weird dilemma. People are going to get these ballots in the mail. They're going to, they're not going to know, is, is this all of the election? I mean, there's no consistency. If we were, I know that as a town clerk, I'd feel much more comfortable if we did, if it were one uniform approach, I realize we can't do that because we don't have the authority, you don't have the authority to do that, but we're going to have, or as it stands right now, we're going to have an in-person town meeting. People will have to request absentee ballots for the town meeting, except all they can vote on our town officers and perhaps the energy plan if it gets to that stage. Then you're going to have to have, but everybody's gonna receive a school ballot. Do, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really kind of mixed up. I guess my question to Chris is, why is the school district taking this approach? Why don't they just, since since we're we still have to uh, uh, hold the town meetings the way our towns have voted to hold town meetings? Why are you now insisting that everybody be mailed a school ballot? Uh, Sarah, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I will find out and relay it. I really don't know the answer to it. Okay, well the board's not going to so, meet again. My guess would be uh, it's COVID related, uh, but I don't know that for a fact. But the but this the, the school board knew that we still have to have town we don't have the authority to to mail everybody uh, complete ballots like we did last year Australian ballots right you know what I, I it hasn't to me it hasn't come up in a, in an in depth discussion like that um, that okay, well that that yeah. just seems stupid to me that that hasn't come up in an in depth discussion and I guess my second question is what's with this December fifteenth deadline why can't you guys go to the to January. Again, I, I didn't set the deadline, so I don't know the answer to that either. But I will get, I'll, you know, if you want to, when's your, oh, no, when you Our next that? meeting is the 21st. Isn't this already a, a moot point because Berlin passed over it? Not if, no, because they're not out of time to have it done if they had a meeting. Um, but you're right. It, it, I mean, that, that seems odd to me that you need the uniformity in order yeah. to, for it to happen because it's, one one can hold up the whole gum up the whole works, which doesn't make sense. Right. But I mean, they the the time has not expired yet. Okay, but again, like like you know, you just said the authority to hold elections rests with the town. So why would the union school district need to have all five do it the same way? Isn't it really up to each individual town to decide how they want to handle this? Um, I think we were looking for uniformity uh, to avoid conflict. 
in terms of well, accounts. It's not a requirement of a charter or anything like that, is it? Or your what, whatever your agreement is to merge, is it? That everything has to be done. Everything has to be done exactly the same way in every town. Um, I don't think that's in the articles of agreement. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the, again, because elections, I don't think that would have been part of the right. articles of agreement. So, so I know you got your hand up, Sarah. Just last year, Berlin also didn't mail, they didn't mail everything out as well. But uh, I guess Rosemary was going to, she was, I think she was going to take, my understanding was that she was insisting on mailing out the individual ballots. And I believe that didn't the school district come in and pick up the cost or send something to jet service. I believe they kind of intervened in the Berlin situation. Didn't they last year? Do you remember? I don't remember that. It's just, okay. you know, that's, I'm wondering if that's another scenario that if that, you know, that the school district should say, fine, four towns voted for it. This one town's not going to do it. So there are ballots. So we're just going to send everything to jet service. I don't know. You mean a mailing list of voters? Just give us your checklist. But then, well, then why wouldn't we just do that? I don't know. Generally. I, I mean, don't why, know. Why, 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 why uh, do it for the obstructionist? You yeah, know? right. <laughs> I, I don't think, I, I don't know. <laughs> right. Max has his hand up. Yep. Oh, uh, I, I don't, I've got a lot of frustration with the WCU USD. Um, they're just basically conducting business without public comment. Um, Chris not understanding the basis for the request is just a symptom of the dysfunction over there. They are not a good neighbor. I think Berlin is uh, very much uh, aware of the lack of neighborly as the, as the district tries to sell off land to the mall uh, from the elementary school property. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to quickly say that, that I don't see any reason to be excessively helpful uh, to that district right now. They're, they've got some real functional issues. Thanks. So, where are we? Well, I'm still going to make the motion. It may not even get a second, but it's not, um... we'll make the motion, Mary. I just did. Well, we didn't, hear it. <laughs> didn't come across. I'm sorry. Okay, I make the motion that the town of Middlesex um, mail the um, the WCUUSD um, ballots for the March 1st, 2022 school meeting to all active registered voters in the town. Is there a second to Mary's motion? There you have it. So the motion fails for uh, for lack of Let, a second. Yeah. So is there a motion to pass over? What are we gonna What are we gonna just do? Leave the lights on. What? Want me to leave the lights on? Yeah, just to put you on lock. I'll make a motion that we pass over that. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to to pass over the request, uh, which would allow us, Chris, if all of a sudden Berlin steps up to the plate and has a special meeting, God knows we've been having plenty of quick special meetings lately. So we could come back and uh, we could come back and reconsider that depending on what happens. And you wanna take a vote on that? Yeah, I haven't yet, but I will. Okay. So all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions or did everybody vote aye? Yes. Liz voted aye. Okay. Yeah. Unanimous. We 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 passed over. Uh, Chris, while we, while we got you here, I do, I do just have one other comment, and I am uh, I have been very concerned about the seasonal issue as well, and I I do really <laughs> understand all the all the COVID stuff and everything that's that's been going on, but. Uh, We've had a lot of, uh, shall we say, obstructionist type 
uh, behavior on behalf of the school district when it comes to using the school, whether it's for uh, summer concerts when the kids aren't even in the school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So at some point in time, we need to focus on that and figure out what the rules of engagement are going to be. And if the school district really is going to deny the town uh, access per the terms of that easement, we'll have to consider pursuing legal action or whatever we have to do, I guess. I, I, haven't, I haven't read that easement in a while, but my memory is it was pretty, uh, pretty broad and straightforward, but maybe it isn't. I, I don't disagree with you because I read it the other day and I think it is pretty clear um, that there's access. Uh, and not with permission. You know, right. I think you coordinate, but it's not a, it's a, I don't think it's a matter of grace, in other words. Um, so let me, what, just describe the obstruction for me, please. What that means. Online access. Okay, like, well, like the, we tried to do something um, and we were told, no, we couldn't do it after, this was for the um, capital spending plan. We had something arranged, Susan and I. Now I can't remember what it was, but they said yes, and then they said no. <laughs> and and who's the decision making? Or who's the? At least I assume it was the principal. No. I, I have no idea. I'd have to ask Susan Clark, but it was a little bit disheartening. And I will say, Chris, that like as we're thinking about the future of the town hall, we have to be very sure that we have access to a building to do our. Um, town meeting, you know, have large groups of, of townspeople in it, which is, was intended to be the school. And I just feel like, you know, we are not getting that vibe from them right now. And maybe it's just COVID, but we're, we're feeling like it's not our building to have town functions in. But, but who is the they? I mean, is it the principal of the school or is it somebody from the administrative offices or both? I think for our town thing that we were going to do, it was the principal said no, but I don't, I don't want to say that. I, I, I don't quote. Yeah. Me. Okay. All, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is we have a new, we have a new superintendent in place. We have a new principal. We have, there are a lot, a lot of moving parts to this, but we need to, clarify what the rules of engagement are going to be on this easement. And if we can't agree with the school district on what the rules of engagement are going to be, then we have to, we have to seek other action because it is, it is important. And it was an important consideration when we agreed to give away our school building. Well, the, the, Peter, just for clarity, we, we didn't agree to give the school building, the legislature compelled it. Um, but, but we took protective action purposely for this purpose. To be able to have access to the school, not only school, but to the, the school property too. Right. And so we right. built the easement in for that yeah. for that very well, no, reason. I agree. The intention of the intention of the easement was that there wouldn't be an issue. Right. But you know, I understand COVID came along. I I I'm, all I'm saying is <laughs> it's a it's a good time when we're discussing some of these other issues. And maybe you could just bring it up to bring it up to Jen when you're talking with her tomorrow morning at nine o'clock and not say we need to deal with it today, but the town is very concerned that we need to figure this Please. out. Right. I will. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everybody. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. See you. Okay. So we are on to discussion RE, the structure of the Middlesex Volunteer Fire Department and whether a question should be put to the voters on the March 1st town meeting uh, action possible. Uh, I asked Sarah to put this uh, on, the, uh, on the meeting for tonight because at our next meeting is when we have our monthly meeting with the fire department. And uh, my sense has been correct or incorrect uh, that there isn't a lot of interest in going ahead and putting an article on the warning um, to restructure the governance of the fire department, but I don't know that. When I have when I brought it up for discussion, we don't have very much discussion. Nobody says anything. Nobody says, nobody says yay or nay. So um, I think it's time, if not tonight, it's going to be time at our next meeting to fish and cut bait and either say we're going to go ahead and put this question of whether the uh, town changes the fire department to the Middlesex town fire department rather than the independent entity or whether we or whether we don't. 
Um, I would also also make the comment that I feel over the course of the last year uh, that we've made tremendous progress in terms of our relationship with the fire department and they have made uh, real progress to address some of the issues that we were that we were concerned about. So, uh, you know, maybe the thing is for the time being, we say we keep, we keep working on working on what we're doing and that we don't, uh, we don't cause a big, big furor in town by, uh, by putting this on the town meeting day ballot. I don't know what the sense of the board is, but I think now we, we said we were going to make a decision on this in September and we never did. Then we were going to talk about it, I think in October, and November, and we never did. So here we are. What's your pleasure? Steve. Um, <clears throat> I agree with you, Peter. I mean, uh, they have, uh, they, we have made a lot of progress with the fire department. I think things are working a lot better. Uh, I, uh, I do apologize. I did not get in touch with the town of Waterbury like I was going to, uh, to get their sense of, of what they're seeing or feeling from this. Uh, but I, I think that for now, I think we should, I guess my feeling is that we should keep trying to improve that relationship uh, with the fire department and keep things going in a positive direction. Um, so I, I guess I'm saying that I don't think it should be on the ballot for this town meeting anyway. Thank you. Other thoughts? Yes, Phil. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I would agree that they have uh, made some progress and this, the, even the tone in terms of um, how they approach us is much better. Um, however, I think we should put it on the ballot. Um, I want to point out that we as a select board have the authority to make this change. But politically, uh, I agree with you, Peter, that if we move forward, it's a question that we really ought to put before the voters. Um, I think the model that we have is very outdated. Um, there are very few of these um, nonprofit fire uh, groups left around the state. And for me, um, I have a hard time getting by the fact that we provide, we literally own all of the assets that they use. We provide 99.9% .9 of their funding. And a critical piece in having it be a um, town department is that the select board gets to appoint the chief. And I think that's a critical piece moving forward. Um, so I would urge that we do put it on the ballot um, and try and resolve this uh, once and for all. It needs, it needs to be a town department. Okay. Um, I would agree with Phil, and I just want to say that if we do put it on the ballot, I think it's really important. I have a hard enough time understanding the pros and cons of either one, that we need to have a, a, um, a very clear one-pager for the townspeople to review, because they are not going to know what they're voting for. That's my biggest fear, is that they have no idea what this even means. Uh, yep. So if we decide to put it on the ballot, which I agree, meaning, so I guess what I meant, meant to say is I don't think we alone should make that decision. I think that if this, if we make this decision, it should be um, brought to the town to review as well, but that we need to educate the town <laughs> about what this is, because it's, it's not entirely still to me clear the, the overall benefit besides the, 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 the chief business. I mean, could we leverage more money in other ways? I, wouldn't that be great? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, and so I think it's super important that if there's someone who feels comfortable doing this one pager and it's not me um, about the benefits of one over the other, um, that has to be part of it. Well, I have got- Dorinda had her hand up, go ahead. Um, 
there's also uh, the financial record key side of which I brought up, um, I think the first year I came on as treasurer, that we are paying all of their bills. We are, um, we handle everything. We get, um, we pay for the insurance, you know, through their budget and all. But they do nothing, so I don't understand why they are a separate entity, and yet they file a tax return using the 60-some thousand dollars that we provide, and they also put a depreciation on the vehicles we own, and it just, it doesn't make sense. It's like, um, it, it's... Yeah. And it's been a concern for a while that it's being done that way. But if they're their own entity, they should have their own checkbook. We should hand the money over to them and they should be handling it. But again, the town's been handling everything. And um, so it, it's like we're half into a separate department and half not. Right. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Mary. I, I agree that, uh, that we should put it on the ballot, but I think that we have to have a point of view. Um, I don't think we can just put it out there and say, oh, you guys decide it. I, so I guess I'm saying, I think we should advance in some ways the points of view that Phil has done, but really do it in an educational way. Um, because I, I mean, if I were faced with this and I didn't know what had been going on and we didn't know the full extent of the support that the, that the uh, town is giving us, uh, you know, you're tempted to just stay with the way it is. I mean, I think we have to say we support having it be part of the town so we have more control over the substantial amount of money we're giving them. Well, we definitely, if, if, if we're going to put this, if we're going to put this on the town meeting, we as a board need to be prepared to say to the town that we put it on there because we support this and we think it's the right thing to do. And here's why in a, in a perfect world, which unfortunately I don't think we're going to get, it would be great if we could get the fire department to agree that this was a good thing. So we could say to the town people, you know, the fire department and the select board are are in favor of this and here's why whether in fact that can happen or not i don't know well uh, we haven't asked we, we really at the, at the next uh at, at our next meeting when we have the fire department here we're going to find out find out how they uh how they feel i mean there is there is as you all know some risk associated with this that we might we might lose the progress we've made over the last year because a number of our firefighters might get upset and say we don't want to be on a town fire department. I don't know the answer to that. But there is some risk that that something like that could happen and we'd be right back in the uh, right back in the in the soup again. But for me, the principle, and this is what I've been saying all along, and I've said it in front of the fire department, so it's no secret how I feel that I don't think it's right that the town as Dorinda said, we pay all the bills, we provide all the money, we do all, all of that, and yet, and yet we have no real control. I mean, we ultimately have control because we can say, you know, starting next year, we're not going to put any money in our budget to support you and, you know, good luck, or, or we're going to restrict the amount of money or whatever. But on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis, we have no control because once the voters approve that budget, we're we're into the next budget year and we're paying their we're paying their bills again. So I have a question. Yes. If if it becomes a municipal fire department where we appoint the chief, does that chief have to be from Middlesex? I don't think so. I'm not certain about that, but I don't think there's any requirement that he be from Middlesex. I think we should probably find out. I found out. Okay. I found out when I did research on this two years ago. No, he's not an elected official. The only reason why people have to be for Middlesex for certain positions is they're because elected. they're elected. They're elected. So he's not going to be an elected fire chief. He's an appointed fire chief. If you if you decided to have an appointed town clerk, like East Montpelier has an appointed town clerk, you could she or he could come from anywhere. Ah. So the other what? 
the other question about this chief business is when we were talking about this the last time, whenever it was a couple of years ago, I think the concept and the idea was that the fire department would come forward with a recommendation for who would be the chief and we would approve it. So yes, we would actually right. do the appointing, but they would do the recommending. So it's not like, it's not like we're going to, we're going to start interviewing people to see who, who we think would be the chief. At least that's how I think it would go. Would the people who are on the volunteer fire department still be volunteers if we're giving them stipends? Yeah. Yes, the answer yes. is yes. So I think, you know, I mean, I feel like the fire department knows that, I mean, we've, we've had this conversation heatedly with them. And I think that we, I mean, I felt like we had a breakthrough with them you know, this summer, I can't remember the timing, but where we were, you know, saying this is not a bad thing, right? Like this is a good thing to be a part of the town. Um, and, and that, you know, we still, we want to support you and we want to be there to be able to help you more really. And, you know, I mean, I'm hoping that we continue with these, you know, monthly meetings that we have with them. Um, I find them really useful. Um, and, you know, I think they have done a great job. And I think that's even sort of more of a reason why it's great to have them as a part of the town. I mean, I, I, I'm in favor of it becoming a municipal um, fire department. Okay, so the, the process is going to be, um, and I don't think we need a we need a motion right now, but I believe we've got uh, we've got a majority of the board who are in favor of putting it on the uh, putting it on the ballot. That when we meet with the fire department in two weeks, we uh, have a discussion about this and and tell them what we uh, what we plan to do and that we hope we're going to have their support. And I don't know whether we should be warning them about that. I don't know how we how we want to handle it. I mean, it'll certainly be in the minutes. It's not like it's a secret what we've talked about tonight. Um, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, and I'm sure they'll probably check in with Sarah or someone who attended the meeting too. I don't but know. I mean, to be truthful, I don't know whether they pay attention to what what's on our what's on our agenda <laughs> or they don't. Yes, Phil. We approach them and say that you know we've had this discussion it's our intention to uh, ask the voters however if they as a nonprofit uh want to voluntarily um become a part a department of the town and we have an agreement between us that that they will do that and we want them to do that then then we can vote and they, um, they could vote, we could vote, we wouldn't need to have a vote um, of the town. It would be an agreement between the two parties. Um, they would come in under, under our umbrella. I don't know whether or not they would do that faced with the idea of a vote or not, but it might be something that's worth throwing out there that says this is our intention. However, you know, maybe we can come to an agreement. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. It is. I, do, I just don't know. I, I mean, the question is, the, the question is before, before our next meeting, when we need to make this decision, should some, some set of us or should I have a conversation with Jeff, the president of the fire department and say, you know, what do you think about this? Uh, we want to talk about it at our next meeting. Uh, yes, Sarah. I, you know, to be quite honest, you're going to meet in two weeks and that seems like they know that you're going to meet with you. It, it seems to me as though probably the better thing to do would be have an open front meeting, just bring them there and just say, look at, here are the minutes, the minutes are posted. I can send the minutes to Jeff and, uh, you, they'll, they'll know by then. I think their meeting is, isn't it tonight? I don't know. Or it's, a, or it's, no, it's on, it's, it's in the 21st. <clears throat> Well, they meet the first and the third as well as we do, yeah. right? But one is a work meeting and the other is a business meeting. So tonight might be the work meeting. Mm. But I'll be happy to send well, a minute. 
to 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 Jeff. I think and someone should have a conversation with them before the meeting. And I think Phil's idea is an interesting one. Give them time to think about it. But I also suggest if we go ahead and we put it on the ballot, if we put it on the warning that we have Rob Halpert draft it so that there are no questions about the legality and all of that. Totally. Sarah? All you're doing is, as you know, we've gone to, we've talked to Rob about this and smartly so the board never, um, the board never created the wording that that would prevent you from using the town buildings that are that is the fire department. But really, all you're doing is creating a town fire department. Shall the shall the town create a town a municipal fire right. department? That's it. Right. Well, and then and then the budget money, if if that happens, the budget money goes to the town fire department, not to the nonprofit. And I don't know how we I don't know how we handle that from the point of view of our. Uh, of our budget. We just got to be careful that we do it correctly. Yes, sir. It's it is in our budget. Well, if anything, they shouldn't really be in our budget to be on our line budget. If the, it's a nonprofit, it's mm -hmm. no different than somebody submitting us a petition every year right. asking us for money because that's really how they're operating. They're not, you know, so much operating under our, the town of Middlesex. It's a big special article every year. <laughs> well, I mean, and but if they well, continue to function as a nonprofit, the that's the point. Yeah. 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 Maybe, they, maybe they should go to the town for their appropriation, not be part of our budget. Exactly. Well, what are the towns? You said there's just a handful like us. Um, are all our neighboring towns municipal fire departments like Worcester and Berlin and the volunteer ones? I believe they are, but uh, but don't hold me to that. Off the top of my head, it's been a while since I was doing research on that. Okay. Uh, there was there was a I can't remember now. There was a town up in the Northeast Kingdom that had a similar situation and basically uh, just created a department and restaffed it. Everybody was quitting. They fired the rest of them and said, "Okay, we'll start." They came back much stronger. Um which is kind of an, an interesting piece. It's been written about in several newspapers. Um, you know, we're not the only ones going through this. That's, you know, there, there's some real issues here. So Berlin, I believe, still has, their fire department is still a volunteer fire department, but funded by the town, I believe. And they're, the last I knew, they were down to seven firefighters. Right. Are they the one that well, goes? Let's do this. I, I would, uh, Assuming everyone agrees, I would just I would just like to have a conversation, and I will I will try and have it face to face. Assuming Jeff Jeff will agree with me, and try and go over these points with him, and see if I just can't warm warm him up because the way the way he goes, the other guys the other guys will follow him. Yeah, um, and uh, just see what we could come up with. I mean, it would be it would be really nice if we could agree to agree and it didn't have to go to a town vote, I agree. Right. And I think better and, and, and easier for the, for the taxpayers to understand. Is there any care you can offer them? I mean, aside from not having a vote, but I mean, or, you know, or any kind of stick, like, you know, next year we're good. You know, something about the budget. I mean, what's the incentive? Well, the, the carrot, the carrot is, that we're going to work with them in the same way we work with the uh, town office and the uh, and the highway department to help them in any way we can to support them to back them up to seek grants to do to do whatever it takes. We work together as a team to try and provide the best fire service we can to the town of Middlesex. But and, what, you know, unfortunately, we've been giving them but giving them a lot of that for free, as Dorinda points out, I mean, we do, we, we provide all their clerical support. We do, we not only pay the money, but we, we pay the bills. We do, uh, we arrange for the insurance. We do everything. Well, what about the stick that would make them want to, well, the, the you stick know, would be, the stick would be that if we're going to, if, if it's going to continue to be a nonprofit, that the proper way for it to be is, 
that it needs to be it needs to be a special article and it goes to the voters every year and it isn't included oh. in our budget and they need to they need to take over the administration of their own bills and perfect uh, through nonprofit entity i love that i love you know, that i think that's the stick isn't it i think so yeah i think that's good i'm glad this is we're not willing you know we're we've decided that we're not willing to confer however however this evolved that we ended up operating the way we're operating it's not proper and it's not correct and we're not willing to do it anymore so you got to decide you, you got to decide what you want to do and we think we can bring real value to the table uh we think we've shown that over the past year we've supported your increase your dramatic increase in your stipends and other things and we've worked well together and uh we want that to continue yeah well this has been willing, a really we're not willing just to keep to accept the status quo going forward if if uh if you decide that you uh you don't want to do that this has been a really fruitful discussion because i think we've really gelled on the issue the pros and the cons. I mean, just in the discussion you're going to have with Jeff. I mean, I'm going to I'm going to put it in as positive a light as I possibly can. But I'm but I'm but I'm willing to talk about the stick because, you know, the the, the carrot isn't as strong as the stick sometimes. Well, that's exactly right. Anyway, great. Okay, so I'm all set. I know what my uh, I know what my mission is, and we can. Uh, Look forward to taking this up at our next meeting. Um, we need to approve the minutes of November 16th and November 30th. Is I move the approval of those two sets of minutes, November 16th and November 30th. You're seconding, Bill? Okay. No. okay. Yeah. All in favor of approving those minutes, please say aye. 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 Uh, you've got enough people signing the orders, Dorinda? Uh, I believe, Mary, did you sign when you came in? I did. I did. Uh, yep, then we're all set. Oh, okay. Great. Correspondence, Sarah? Uh, no. I usually forward all the correspondence I get right yes. away to you guys. Yep, okay. And uh, any other matters to come before the board tonight? Then I'd say we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. I'm sorry for... Uh, Five minutes. One meeting, but we had a lot to deal with. Sarah, it was a good meeting, though. We got a lot done. Sarah, you know? we do have to come in and sign something, though, right? The select board. You've got to sign the. Uh, it's there's no big rush, but I'll. Uh, I'm going away for a few days, but I'll just leave it out there. It's the. It is the order of the Dolan Road. Okay. Perfect. I'll stop that tomorrow. And yep. for the record, if you have not ordered or purchased Sarah's book, oh stop. Oh. You must. I am riveted. I'm up at night reading it, and I just got to a part where I'm like, what? She gets a text from who? I just want you to know that there was a Wait great a New York second. Times review, oh, and it's, a, it's an Amazon pick for, uh, yes. for the month of December. You guys, this is amazing. Nice. New York Times oh, right. Amazon pick. I put it on my Christmas list. <laughs> Santa knows I want it. I, I'm going to Barnes & Noble tomorrow to buy my copy. Thank of you, Mary. The Anybody else want me to get them a copy while right. I'm there? Thank it's you guys. called um, "Do Do I Know You?" Yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. 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 is it on? Thank Kindle? you, Sarah. Suffice it suffice it to say, we're very proud of you. We're and so we're proud about your book. It's and my it's other family. Christmas Thank you very much. All. You're very nice. And I'm going to come yeah. in and get it signed. By the way. Oh, I'm, yeah. side too. I'm sure you guys want to go home. Yes, oh, you are home. <laughs> we are. We are home. <laughs>